Ready. What, Ready. Have, you, what have you got on your head? <laughs> Russian. It's Russian episode. It, it is Russian. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome back to War Mysteries. I'm joined as always by Matt. Hello. And I am Jay. So towards the end of World War I, a great change would sweep across imperialist Russia. Uh, when Tsar Nicholas II and his immediate family were all executed uh, in Yekaterinburg by Bolshevik revolutionaries. At the collapse of House Romanov and the subsequent rise of the Bolshevik Republic would sweep away centuries of monarchy, eventually pressing the Soviet Union into power. At around the same time, a vast quantity of gold reserve was transported from its storage in the city of Petrograd and spirited away from the threat of encroaching German forces to the west. Some of the bullion was recovered, but a huge quantity disappeared and was never seen again. At the time, the Romanov gold reserve was the third largest in the world. What became of this gold has been the subject of over a century of investigation, leaving in its wake a trail across Russia, Siberia, and even into the Far East. This is the legacy of House Romanov. It's Russian. Well, it's summer. That is Russian. Yes, it is Russian. <laughs> it's a Russian summer. It is hat. real, in fact. It is real. It is real. It's actually from Red Square. Or oh, it's Zinzi Square, I suppose they call it. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to put this down here now because it's actually getting too big. So we're going back to 1917, imperialist Russia. Uh, Nicholas II is in power. They've withdrawn from World War One. What's going on? Uh, to fight a civil war in their own country. Bolshevik revolution was afoot. All right. So, might as well start with some pictures. I've made you a little impressive book. To Russians, what I'm looking at. So that's Tsar Nicholas II and his immediate family, you know, the Empress and his daughters and son, who is, I guess there, it's the most male looking one. Okay, that's the first process, Exhibit A. That is Exhibit A. So they were executed on July the 16th, 1918. So about seven or eight months after the October Revolution. Um, so all of them, including... The kids. All right. all, uh, that's horrible. I believe they were shot. Okay. And when that happened, a monarchy of 300 years was stamped out for good. And there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of conjecture as to who the surviving members of the family are and... Bit of a mystery, isn't it? Yeah, a little bit. Common, those on this show. Yeah, we get a lot of them. So, the Romanov legacy, the Romanov fortune, it's sometimes known as, was gold bullion, jewellery, you know, plunder. What was it you said back in series one? Brilliance. Brilliance. <laughs> yeah, they're like gems. You, you must, uh, you've, I mean, you've had two years to read on it. So, yeah, as you know, as I've, I've yet to find anything on the subject apart from the Wikipedia page I know that you made. Okay. So 500 tonnes of gold and other stuff. <laughs> okay. And brilliance. Yeah, right. Was transported out, essentially, of imperialist Russia and to the east. Get it as far away from the front lines as possible. Um, into Siberia, as it would transpire. Right, so anyway, let's, let's get in there. Let's get our teeth into the matter. Let's have a look at what was going on in and around the time. When war broke out in 1914, Tsarist white forces moved quickly to Petrograd to secure and transport nearly 500 tonnes of Romanov royal family gold reserve since it was felt to be too close to Russia's western frontier and vulnerable to looting should their enemy advance inland. It was transported far to the east, to Kazan. By the summer of 1918, Leon Trotsky's Bolshevik forces took Kazan after bitter fighting, 
but upon searching the central Kazan bank, the vaults were completely empty. The gold had been evacuated again. What have you done? That's your mic. I found that. Jones! Ah, oh, lovely. Basically, so far, it's gone across Sib well, towards Siberia, across and stopped in Kazan. Gone in the bank. Leon Trotsky's heard about it and gone, hang on. I want that. Yeah. And we'll be, I, th I think we'll be having that gold. Gone to the bank. Goes in, goes up to the teller. There's she says, says, yeah, it's not here anymore. In Russian. All right. Obviously. Yeah. Privyet. No gold. Angry, obviously. Really yeah. angry. Probably shot a few people. You know, like. Rode a motorbike down the train tracks after the train. Well, no, they, they actually got their own train right. and chased them. But obviously, because there's a civil war going on, the shortages of fuel, uh, the, you know, the shortages of manpower, sometimes these guys have been called forward to fight. So it's more of a bits moving a bit at a time kind of race. Right. A dash. Discerning that such a vast amount of bullion could only have been transported by train, the Red Army gave chase across Siberia, even further east. This would not have been a rapid journey by any means. Civil war was ravaging the country, and coupled with fuel shortages and winter weather, it would have taken many months to traverse the frontier. At some point during this pursuit, the train fell under the control of Admiral Alexander Kolchak, commander of the White Forces in the East, and the train was immediately ordered to continue its journey eastward, with Kolchak in tow. It eventually arrived at Irkutsk. That's Admiral Kolchak. He is an admiral in the White Army, or the imperialist forces. The train makes its way to his territory, near a place called Irkutsk, mm -hmm. which is further to the east, like right out in the eastern frontier, right. near a place called Baikal, and there's a lake there, the biggest freshwater lake on the planet. It's called Lake Baikal. Do you no. know that because you've been fishing there? I don't know. No. I have, no. What? Quite carbon heavy, isn't it? Like the footprint. Yeah. So, that's where they've got to. And now, they've got a bit of a problem. Because they've turned up in Irkutsk. And now, in the Civil War, the White Army was outnumbered by the Red Army. So, they had to hire mercenaries. Um, so, you know, guns for hire, soldiers for hire. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, they got a lot of them from the Czech Republic, or Czechoslovakia back then. And a, a massive garrison of those were stationed at Irkutsk and they got wind of this gold train. So let's find out what happened next. It was in Irkutsk that the first complication arose. Czech battalions that had been hired to fight alongside Russia in World War I were stranded after Bolshevik forces had seized large swathes of the eastern provinces. They were cut off from their home country, and were very keen to escape. Upon the arrival of the gold train, word spread quickly, and the Czech forces saw an opportunity to buy their way out of the situation. Fair enough. Did they use the um, jewels that belonged to Romanov and his family. They saw this train coming in, word got around. It's pretty hard to miss a train with, you know, 500 tonnes of gold on it. And they figured, right, well, we're stuck. We want to go home, had enough of this war. Bollocks to Russia. Let's get some of this gold. Let's get this, let's sort ourselves out, pay the Bolsheviks off and piss off back home. That's what I mean. So they stole this. Overpowering Admiral Kolchak's soldiers. Our oh boy in there. And they seized the train, with which they bartered for their freedom by offering gold and him. And him? Yeah, so they, they said, right, we've got Kolchak here, this boy. We've got a load of gold back there. You can probably see the train. It's quite big. You let us go home. You can have that and that. But why would they want him? Because he's a leader of the opposing... They want to kill him, don't they? Yeah. I mean... You can probably see this is it's not going to end well for the admiral, no. let's put it that way. Is there a mystery coming up? <laughs> yeah, better be. A quantity of the gold, equating to 25 train cars, was handed over. The exact value of this gold is disputed, but is thought to be approximately $8.2 billion worth in 2021 dollars. Admiral Kolchak was shot dead. 
the Czech forces were allowed to leave, but eastward, meaning a journey across the Siberian peninsula to Vladivostok, where they would sail to the west and back home. Where the remainder of the gold ended up, however, is the subject of this mystery. They shot Admiral Kolchak immediately. Dead. Before he That's... even got over there. <laughs> no, no, probably not. <laughs> I mean, they, you know, they had to get that problem out of the way. <laughs> uh, don't, bring, don't bother bringing him over here, we'll just shoot him. Now, the Czechs were allowed to leave, uh, but they had to go east, not west. They couldn't guarantee their safety if they went back through the front lines. So they said, right, you can go home. We won't chase you, we won't pursue you, but you're going to go east. That means they've got to make a journey across the Siberian Peninsula all the way to Vladivostok. Not a long way. Well, it's the far, far eastern frontier of Russia. It's near China. Long way. Long, long way. It's yeah. on the coast of the Pacific. So they had to go all the way over to Vladivostok, get in a boat, and then sail back across down through the Pacific, underneath Japan, Korea, India. That's a long way, isn't it? It's a long, long yeah. way. So the answer was yes. This left what has now been determined to be about 240 million rubles worth of gold missing. Is that some of it there? But that is the gold in the bank vaults. A lot of it. It's the last known photograph of the gold. In Was that taken on an iPhone? <clears throat> and we're having a break. Where this 240 million rubles have ended up is the subject of this mystery. <sighs> so, it's, it's not gone really to plan. They've shot this gold across Russia. It's got a bit sticky. The Bolsheviks have got wind of it. They've chased them. They've turned up. These uh, Czech boys are there. They've got wind of it. Not a very well kept secret. Evidently. So they're thinking, all right, fine, fine. We'll, we'll, we'll give them all this gold. We can go home, kill him. Done. Yeah, Admiral. And the gold essentially gets split. 410 million rubles goes to the Bolsheviks. A lot of that has been recovered. You can see some of the crown jewels now in Russia in various museums. Oh, okay, so they got it back. They got some, some back. of it back. Uh, but a chunk, nearly a third, went missing. Fair enough. And then and that's the subject of our mystery. And it is a mystery. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> there's four. Pro you enjoying them? Hmm. I know it. I know that. It isn't bacon, but my brain basically thinks it's bacon. <laughs> so it is bacon, isn't it? Since we're, you know, not really on the subject of anything that people are here to watch, can you explain the Oscar, please? That's over there. Just, just in general. What, uh, why, why is that? Why is that there? It's part of the set. Yeah, but... Mm. There's not, you say there's no prevailing reason. Okay, moving on. So there's four prevailing theories, uh, which obviously we're gonna we're gonna get into. They kind of follow a little bit chronologically. But the first theory, which, which was probably the one that people would be thinking is the most obvious, is that the gold was stolen by the Czechoslovak Legion. The Czech and Slovak Legion forces that had sided with Imperial Russia were originally volunteer soldiers, and also included deserters from the Austro-Hungarian army. They found themselves cut off from their allies when the Bolsheviks captured most of the eastern provinces, forcing them into hiding and to scatter. The arrival of the gold train may seem to have presented a literal golden opportunity to buy their way out of what would otherwise have been a hopeless situation, a trade that would likely have been a relief given that Kolchak was shot without a moment's hesitation. By the Czech soldiers. Bang. Shot him. That's what I mean, they didn't even, they didn't even need to walk over <clears> towards him. I mean, not a jot of concern. Point him out. <laughs> <laughs> they were encircled, essentially. The Bolsheviks were all over them. And also included deserters from the Austro-Hungarian army. That would be the army that our boy Vampire was in. Ah, okay. Yeah. From the so, episode. potentially, he might have ended up nicking this gold. And then pissing off to America and, you know, being a janitor. That would be nice if it would <clears throat> be a mystery together. be nice. Yeah. 
Probably not. Um, so the gold was the ticket. Pretty much. It couldn't have arrived at a better time, really. They, uh, they yeah. had a, a literal golden opportunity sitting there. A journey back to Czechoslovakia would have taken many months, especially travelling across to Vladivostok beforehand, and would have been an expensive journey. Gold bullion, however, would certainly have offset those costs. Additionally, with such a vast sum in hand, it's not unlikely that they may have squirrelled some away. Where, however, is another matter. They might easily have buried gold crates at any time prior to their departure from Irkutsk, perhaps at some point along the way, or even back in Czechoslovakia. When it's considered that a total of 67,739 people left from Vladivostok, including almost 60,000 military personnel, it's not difficult to envisage that a fair quantity of the gold may indeed have been stolen. Obviously, because they're going by either train or a cart, I guess. Or maybe if they were lucky, a car, but you've got a whole legion. Could have horses. <clears throat> they may have had some horses. Moped! So with such a vast sum in hand, it's not unlikely that they might have squirreled some away before revealing it to the uh, Bolsheviks. They might have hidden it uh, and, you know, pocketed a couple of... It's like that girl that found the mine that we talked about. Um, there's high as gold in that mine over there and didn't, you know, like, didn't take any of it. Especially if there's 67 odd thousand people that know about it. I'm surprised it all didn't go. It's a hard secret to keep. So what do you think of that one then? It's, it seems quite obvious, you know. There's not an awful lot of proof, that's the problem. You can't, there's no, you know, you can't say, right, well, it went back to Czechoslovakia and it was spent here and they cashed it in here. And, uh, this bank received a ridiculous amount of gold all of a sudden. Or, it just, just mm. kind of disappeared. Maybe. A lot of people, though, 67,000 people, you know. Maybe everybody just kept it as a souvenir. Just grab an ingot. Yeah, a good theory. Maybe it was stolen. So, possible. Probably time now to look at the second theory, which is that it was lost in Lake Baikal. Lake Baikal, at over 5,340 foot deep, houses over 20% of the world's total surface fresh water. It is also larger than Belgium in total surface area. In the late 1910s, a railway line known as the Kruger Baikalskaya line passed by the lake close to Cape Poliovinyi, which is the focus of this theory. After a fashion, it shares similarities with the previous theory in that the Czech soldiers heading to the east are reportedly involved. Eyewitness accounts from the local area mention a train carriage, or in some cases, carriages that collapsed from the tracks into the lake, allegedly one of the many cars that were carrying the treasures further east. So we can assume that at least a portion of these uh, Czech and Slovak Legion soldiers that were escaping, essentially, were on a train which was going past Lake Baikal, which goes to the east. All right, yeah, that makes sense. So they may have had some on this train with them. So it's more of a folk, like a local folk story really, like a kind of a local thing that's been passed down between families. But there was a, a train that passed around the same time and the track broke away from the cliff. Oh. And the remaining, like a few of the cars at the back fell off. Tumbled into the tumbled, water. Just rolled down a hill and so, into the lake. But you would have thought people had been down to have a look for that. But it's so deep, may never find it. it well, yeah, it's the five and a, nearly five and a half thousand feet at its deepest point. Unbelievable. Another variant of this story contends that the train tracks themselves gave way on the lake surface, which was frozen at the time, leading to the entire train collapsing into the depths under the sheer weight. Laying temporary train track on frozen lakes was a common practice at the time to expedite travel. The lake is still in fact used to this day as an alternative route for traffic. Right. And it wasn't uncommon at the time especially in Russia, when the lakes froze over, they'd lay temporary train tracks on it. If it was that thick, you could send a train across it. So you could just go straight over the... Over the ice. Lake. Like, instead of going round it, you can just go straight across it. But obviously, a train car with 500 tonnes of gold on it and the weight of the train on top. 
clever. Um, dangerous, but clever. Yeah, very, very dangerous. Although these theories seem to contradict one another in how the cars ended up in the lake, there is actually some evidence to support them. All right. Show me the evidence. The rusting hulk of a period correct railway car undercarriage was discovered during a scientific operation in 2010 by the Mir 2 submersible. At approximately 400 metres down, the glint of gold was also spotted through the lake bed, but was unreachable. As of this year, 2021, nothing has been recovered from the lake. Or at least nothing has been reported, you know what Richard's like. So we could potentially, that's going to be a really difficult on location, actually. <clears throat> yeah, we're not going to. There's a few different stories to support it. There's locals, there was a couple of newspaper um, articles that were written quite recently about this mere submersible and what locals said happened. Okay. Um, is there any video footage of... Yeah, there probably is somewhere. Some of the uh, researchers say that it was at 700 metres. Some say 400 metres. 700 metres under the water. How far did Titanic go down? To the bottom of the Atlantic. What's that? 100 metres? 200. Try a couple of miles. Probably further. Alright, so maybe the whole thing went in the water. Well, there is a little... Yeah. I mean, you know what lo local stories get twisted? Apparently there was a diver who could stay underwater for five minutes. Did he have oxygen? Well, because then it's easy. He, he must have done, because, you know, nobody can hold their... Uh, breath for that long. Chuck Norris can hold his breath for five minutes. No, Chuck Norris gets into water and water holds its breath. Uh, so that's theory number two. A bit more evidence to support that one. I mean, you, you never really know whether people are telling the truth or not with this kind of stuff. There's people that say, oh, my, my great granddad was involved in trying to find the it. The I just wanted to be in the local gazette. Maybe, yeah. So let's move on to our next theory then. Theory number three, uh, that it was hidden in the Kazan province. Another local legend claims the gold is buried close to Lake Baikal, the soldiers assisted in this by the villagers. Many years later, one of these villagers disappeared into the forests while trying to relocate the burial site, and was never seen again. Logic would seem to dictate that any buried crates would be located relatively close to the railroad, given the weight of the gold and the likelihood of detection. Troubling the issue further, it is likely to have been buried under the cover of darkness to conceal the theft. It is unlikely to be located without a dedicated and specific effort, but with scant evidence to support the theory beyond rumour and conjecture, and no forthcoming reliable sources, this is at best a remote possibility. Well, um, so he allegedly knew where it was, but when he went out to find it, he ended up not coming back. Dead. Maybe. Could be dead. You never know. Ran off with it. To Vegas. It's a whole train load of gold and stuff, isn't it? It's not like you're just going to yeet it out the side carriage. No. You know, you, you could yeet individual ingots of it into the lake. Ingot yeeting. Well, yeah, but you could, but then you're never going to get it back. You never remember where it was. You, usually people bury treasure. They kind of mark a tree or... Well, you're not going to get it anyway because it's 200 miles deep. So, it's... <laughs> so that's a bit weaker, a bit shakier, that one. There's, yeah. Again, there's not the, the problem with this is no one really knows where it is. Spoiler alert. So it's a bit of a uh, you know a bit mystery. Of a, a bit of a mystery. Yeah. They all are, aren't they? Happens a lot around here. I'm not as keen on that theory. <clears throat> no, I'm. I have to say, when I was reading about it, there were a couple of chuckles. Are there any pictures about that theory in the book? There's some other purported locations that it was buried. Okay. The Tiger Railway Station. Big place, for sure. Kenarovo region, the polar Urals. Um, so there's lots of different places it may have ended up. Uh, okay, city of Omsk. Okay, I'm going to put this away now. So let's move on to our fourth and final theory then, which is a bit of a bit of a nomad, a bit of an outlier, mm -hmm. and that is that the gold was sent to Japan. <laughs> A 
According to documents that were discovered in former Soviet archives in 1994, Kolchak had intended the Tsar gold, or at least a sum of it, to make its way to Japan for safekeeping. These documents allegedly refer to approximately 22 boxes of bullion. During the civil war in Russia, Japan sent military assistance to the white forces supporting the crown against the Bolsheviks, which led to tensions and hostility throughout the Cold War. Of particular note, Japanese forces were in fact in the region of Trans-Siberia and even close to Lake Baikal at the time the gold allegedly disappeared. Whether this had any bearing on the eventual destination of the gold is unclear, but certainly looks to support the theory. How much is in the box? I worked that out, actually, and it took me a, a long time to do it. Right. <coughs> Bless him! <coughs> Jesus! <coughs> Sorry, that was a lot. So, in total, gold, jewellery, other stuff, you know, there's minerals, there's, there's lots of wealth. 1,600 tonnes of That's a lot. treasure. 40 train cars because there's 5,000 crates and 1,700 sacks. Right. So that means if there's 40 train cars, there's 125 crates per car mm -hmm. and 42 to 43 sacks per car. 22 times 125. All right. A lot. Interestingly, this theory was somewhat reinforced in February of 2019, when a statement was made by the Russian foreign minister concerning the matter. She said, There was a question about gold in Japan. On the basis of available evidence, it has been repeatedly raised with Japan through diplomatic channels. Currently, it is not an issue of foreign policy between Japan and Russia, but if further evidence presents itself, it will be. This is, this is actually quite interesting, I didn't know this. Russia and Japan never signed an official peace treaty to end their Second World War conflict. No. So, on so, paper at least, Russia and Japan are at war. Have been for eighty-five years. All right. Fair obviously, enough. obviously they're not. You know, they're not in combat with one another, but they never signed a peace treaty because they really didn't like each other. There's no evidence it was ever in the Tokyo vaults. There's no evidence it ever made it there. Nobody's seen it there and blowing <coughs> the whistle. No. Nope. All right. Lying. Politician. So, could could be lying. But that's that's pretty much it. So, so maybe that's not. I mean, the, the the cut and thrust of it. Jesus. The cut and thrust of it really is, it either got squirrelled away by Czech and Slovak forces, or it was buried somewhere in Kazan, maybe near a railway station in the Taiga region, or it went ended up in Japan, or it was lost in the lake. Well, that's just the theories, isn't it? Obviously, yeah, that's pretty much it. So they are all the theories. They're the main prevailing theories. Oh. Yeah, there are a few others, like they spent it. Okay, so our conclusion then... Well, well what do you think? What do you, what, what do you think is most likely? I think it's most likely, after that, maybe some went in the lake, maybe some people nicked a bit, maybe they spent a bit, I don't know. So let's, this is a list of treasures that were recovered by the KGB. Oh, so right. forget about the train for now, because that, that vanished. Loads then. So that's, a, yeah, you can see what there is. And are you going to get that scrolling up the screen? Yeah, we can have it going up. That's just not a bad idea, we'll do that. You want to start it off by pointing or... No, just in the just anywhere on the screen. Do you want it here? Yeah. yeah. Somewhere. Any f***ing where. I mean, there's tons. That's a lot of stuff. <clears throat> I mean, there's so much, I feel like we should wait a few seconds for it to keep scrolling. Or are you going to... So we can just speed it up. up. All right. A little bit. Loads of stuff. There it gets done. Right. So, our conclusion then is... Uh, 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 no idea. <laughs> I think the conclusion then is a bit of a blend of everything. I think there's something to this lake theory. Um, people don't tend to make up the fact that trains roll off tracks. 
it's kind of a specific thing to say, really. I would, you know, if if someone if you saw two or three train cars fall off a track and go doo -doo 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 into a lake, you'd probably remember it. No, I wouldn't be on a frozen lake with a train to start with. You would if you were in Russia in 1918. Probably. Because obviously they sent the submersible down about a decade ago and they found some they found something. Um, the Russian government came out shortly after that and said, oh, we found a tunnel, by the way, with the train in it and the gold's been recovered. No pictures. No pictures. Lying. So there you go. So a bit of a mixture then. So our conclusion then is undetermined. Alright, so all in all, no one really knows where the gold ended up. No one's no one's owned up to it. Um, the problem is it kind of got pushed by the wayside with the whole the, the whole October Revolution and the rise of the Bolsheviks and the Socialist Party. And over the last hundred years people have gone to try and find it in various different places, various different rumours that they've heard. But it hasn't happened. Not you know. The bits and pieces have been recovered here and there, like the KGB in the thirties and um, a couple of expeditions that were made in like the seventies and the eighties recovered bits. So let's 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 wrap it up. Let's see we'll see where it all leads. House Romanov and its descendant line ruled Imperial Russia for more than 300 years. At its height, the empire spanned from Poland to Alaska, Finland to Turkey, at one time encompassing nearly one-sixth of the Earth's surface. It was the third largest empire in history. World War I placed huge pressure on Russia with events consequently leading up to the extermination of the Romanov family, the destruction of its monarchy, and the rise of the Soviet Union. The legacy of House Romanov, boiled down to just its physical remnants, is embodied in various jewellery, regalia, documentation, and of course, gold. Despite the usual myths that tend to encircle all great tales of lost treasures, much of the Romanov gold is in fact accounted for. Some was certainly used to finance the civil war. More still was traded for lives by Czech battalions, sent back across Siberia to Kazan. Romanov-era jewellery can even be seen in the Russian State Archive of Social and Political History recovered by the passage of time and the actions of keen political parties. But the legend lives on. Be it in folk stories, cryptic archives, vague news reports or rumours found in the pages of history books. In 2017 it was claimed that a large train carriage loaded with Tsar-era gold was discovered near Lake Baikal evidently hidden in a cave system on one of the old, temporary Trans-Siberia lines. But this has never been verified. The First World War cost Imperial Russia over $22 billion between 1914 and 1917, a time at which the stabilising influence of vast gold reserves would be sorely missed the uprising that followed shortly after the fall of House Romanov and the end of World War I set the stage for indiscriminate socialist terror for decades to follow, beginning with Lenin, continued by Hitler, Stalin, Mussolini, Pol Pot and Chairman Mao, one and all the distant children of the savage October Revolution. As for what remains of the Romanov legacy, only time will tell.
That's it. That's uh, about all we know about the Romanov legacy. So that's that. Yeah. More Another. missing gold. More economies collapsed. Uh, and obviously, the stage then being set for, what, 80 or so years of the Soviet Union to just kind of walk across all of its people. Things didn't get better for Russia after, uh, after the, mon the monarchy collapsed. Things only got worse for a long time. Okay, All so right, so another mystery smashed. Not really. Kind of. So that's uh, another episode of War Mysteries. That's another another one uh, delved into. Thank you very much for watching. Obviously, uh, we do have more on the way. Stay with us. They are they are coming in good time. Nearly at the end of series three, though. You, keep, you like to keep count. Close, yeah. One more episode to go before we wrap up World War One. Obviously, we are planning future episodes. Uh, we've got a few special... Uh, ideas in the pan. And let's, let's let's have a look at some of our new subscribers, shall we? Let's see who we've got. Why not? Well, I mean, why not? Since the previous episode and this one airing, uh, we've had quite a few people that have started following us. We've got Mr. Top Gun 624 He's joined us. Uh, True Blade. True Blade. Uh, Rat Nose Terry. Rat Nose Terry. Yeah. Uh, Joe Porter. We have Wicked Skittle. As in the no, thing that you bowl name. at or the thing that you eat? Well, that, I think we're going to have to get Wicked Skittle to comment and ask the question. That would be good, wouldn't it? That would be pretty good. If, you, if you're there, Wicked Skittle, let us know which it is. Is it the large plastic when you hit with a bowling ball or is it the tasty little sugary treat? A Gordon 002. Good to have somebody that works for the British Secret Service with us. Um, yeah. Uh, Timotheus Zamora. Uh, we've got Piotr Yafien. Uh, Richard Wolf. Richard Wolf, uh, Arvin Aguila, Scott Chalker. Okay, a few more. We've got HT uh, Rugillo, 24. We've got JG. JG. Nice, nice and simple. Uh, Sasanka Barua. Hello. Matt George. Know him. Do you? No. Your namesake. Brock Davignon, uh, The Lone Gamer. Uh, okay, and one more. We've got QK1. QK1. One. Welcome to the uh, channel. So yeah, quite a few, quite a few new subscribers. It's good we, uh, for, to have a bit to feel the support. It is. It's, it's always good to hear that we've got new subscribers. We we love reading all your messages. It's always good to hear from our viewers. So thank you very much for any comments. Of course, if you want to leave any comments, comments box is down there. Uh, we do have an Insta. If it's, it is still going, I'm not subscribed to it anymore. He's not yeah, he's, he's unsubscribed. And he's on the show. So we've got obviously one more episode to go. Uh, stick with us for that. That is, it's fully scripted. We'll be shooting that very soon. When this episode airs, it will be well underway. Give the video a like if you think we've earned it. And obviously if you subscribe to our channel, you'll be notified of any future videos of which there are a few coming up. Yeah, go on. Like, follow, subscribe. That's, that's, that sounds about right to me. And we will see you in the next one. We will. So are we gonna make this available yeah, for we'll, viewers to buy? He, no. <laughs> so if you really, if you, I mean, this is packed with exciting stuff from the episode. We might start doing it every episode, um, and we can sell them on line. And um, I'm going to leave now. So you want to sign us off? You sign us off. I okay. always sign us off. I don't want to sign us off. All right. Turn the video off. <laughs>